you an introduction. I want to give you an introduction as to um, something that was that's written in the spirit of prophecy. In the spirit of prophecy, there, there are certain sections that deal with the coming crisis. There's a crisis coming. And uh, just before that crisis comes, um, or just before Ellen White wrote about that crisis, she wrote the words that I'm about to read to you now. So I'm going to read these words, then I'll pray, and then we can get into the message. I want you to listen to what she says. This is in Third Selected Messages, page 383, paragraph 1 to 3. It's not long. Just listen carefully. Great things are before us, and we want to call the people from their indifference to get ready. If you have your Bibles, go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs chapter 22. I've just read what she said, and she says, great things are before us, and we want to call the people from their indifference to get ready. Now, listen to this in Proverbs 22 and verse 3. It says, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. So here in this verse, you have two, two groups of people. You have the prudent and the simple. The prudent man sees what's coming. He does something about it. He hides in Jesus. The simple man, he passes by indifferent, unconcerned, and eventually he's punished. We've just read in inspiration, it says, we want to call the people now in the world and in the church of God to get ready for what's coming. She goes on. We are not now to cast away our confidence, but to have firm assurance, firmer than ever before. Now is the time when we leave this place today. We want to have a firm assurance, firmer than we have ever had. Not in ourselves, but an assurance in the love, the mercy, and the power of God to save us. Listen to what she says. We will look to the monumental pillars, reminders of what the Lord hath done for us to comfort and to save us from the hand of the destroyer. She goes on, she says, we can but look onward to new perplexities in the coming conflict. In the coming conflict, there are going to be new perplexities. As I was sitting there, I was thinking to myself. A time is coming where we will no longer have Zoom. A time is coming where we will no longer be able to buy or sell the way we do right now. New perplexities are continuously rising. She says, new perplexities are coming in the coming conflict. But listen to what she says. But we may look on what is past as well as what is to come and say, hitherto hath the Lord helped us and he will help us to the end. And so she says, go to Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy chapter 33. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 25 is such a precious promise. Listen to what this, the Bible says. It says, thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. In other words, every day that you live upon planet earth, God is given grace or strength sufficient to that day. Listen carefully to what the servant of the Lord says. She says, the trial in the coming conflict will not exceed the strength which shall be given us to bear it. So as we consider the trial, as we consider the perplexities, as we consider the trouble that is ahead of us, God is saying to us that the grace and the strength that he gives us is greater than those trials. Listen. She says, then let us take up our work just where we find it without one word of repining, imagining nothing can come, but that strength will come proportionate to the trials. Our present peace must not be disturbed by anticipated trials. You know, sometimes when we speak about the time of trouble, we become so fearful and so worried that we're anxious about what's going on from day to day. She's saying, God is saying to us, we must not let what is coming before us disturb our present peace. She goes on, she says, for God will never leave nor forsake one soul who trusts in him. God is better unto us than our fears. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful opening to the thoughts that she says concerning the coming crisis? That is, this is what God wants us to understand right now as we're about to face the greatest challenge that we've ever faced. And so I'll just remind us of these few thoughts. God wants us to shake off the indifference that we have right now. If we are indifferent right now, let us shake it off. It's time to wake up. Number two, let us have firm assurance in what our God can do for us. 
Number three, let us look forward to what's coming, but also let us look back at the way the Lord has led us. And finally, God's grace and strength will exceed what we are about to face. Amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we direct our prayer to the most holy place. We thank you for the promise that you have made where your people are there, you will be. Please come and abide with us now as we worship you. Come and speak to each one of our hearts as we study your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles to the scripture reading, Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. That's where we're going to be studying from today. Joel, the second chapter. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel chapter 2. And let's read the scripture reading, verse 28. Joel 2, verse 28. The Bible says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. God's promise to you and I as we live in the last days of earth's history is that he is going to empower us with his spirit. Now, this verse had a partial fulfillment when the early rain fell on the day of Pentecost. In fact, Peter quoted this verse when he began his sermon in, in Acts chapter 2. He said, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. That was a partial fulfillment. And remember what happened under that early rain. How many were baptized in one day? 3,000. That was the power that attended the early rain. But the latter rain is going to be greater. A time is coming when this church is going to overflow. You know, as I was driving to, driving to church this morning, my wife said, and we didn't know how many people were going to be in the church. My wife said, today, football stadiums are full. Pubs are full. But when you get to the house of God, it's sad, brothers and sisters. That's why I want to appeal to those online. Now is the time where we want to get to church if we can. I'm not saying break any COVID rules or come here if you're ill. No, but when we have opportunity, come to worship in the house of God. And so the Bible tells us a time is coming when the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out. And let us look at the time frame when this is. Notice what the Bible says in Joel 2 and verse 30. It says, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Now, these are prophecies that have already been fulfilled. The sun has already been darkened. The moon has already turned to blood. So these prophecies have already been fulfilled. And I want you to notice what Joel says in the next verse, verse 32. It says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be delivered. And then it says, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. This verse, verse 32, tells us that when the Spirit is poured out, there's going to be a place on planet Earth where the people of Earth and the people of the church can find deliverance. Where is that place? Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion according to verse 32? The remnant. Who is the remnant? You and I have the privilege, brothers and sisters, and unfortunately we don't often realize it, we have the privilege of being part of God's remnant movement. Isn't that a privilege? It's not a right that you and I have the privilege to be here. It's a privilege that the God of heaven has made for you and I to be a part of this movement. But he didn't call us into this movement just to sit in pews and wait for the coming of Jesus. He called us in here, according to Peter, so that we can show forth the praises of him who had called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. But I want you to notice what verse 32 says. Listen to this. It says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion shall and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. So God here mentions the place of deliverance as Zion. Now, brothers and sisters, look at verse 23. Verse 23, we're studying this morning. It says in verse 23, be glad then you children of Zion. Now look at verse 15. Verse 15, it says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Now look at verse 1, friends, verse 1. It says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Let's stop there for a moment. Let me ask you a question. What is this chapter dealing with? Who is this chapter dealing with? It's dealing with Zion. At the beginning, first verse, Zion. At the end, Zion. In the middle, Zion. Repeatedly, this verse is talking about Zion. 
And we found out in verse 32 that Zion represents the remnant. But I want it to be clear to those who may not know what we're talking about. Go to Isaiah 51. Who is the Zion? Isaiah chapter 51. In Isaiah 51 and verse 16. You see, this is where God is going to have a place of deliverance, brothers and sisters. Isaiah 51 verse 16, the Bible says, And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I might plant the heavens and lay the foundation of the earth, and say unto Zion, Thou art what? My people. So who is Zion, church? It's the people of God. It's the remnant. So Joel chapter 2, when it repeats Zion, 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 it's speaking about the people of God. It's speaking about you and I. And it's letting us know what you and I need to do to be prepared for the final outpouring of God's Spirit. Are you with me so far, friends? Let's go back to Joel chapter 2. You see, before Zion can become a place of deliverance, there's something that must take place in Zion. Or in the church of God. Listen to what the Bible says in Joel 2. And I'm reading verse 1. Joel 2 and verse 1. The Bible says. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. And sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand. Friends is it clear to us that the day of the Lord is at hand? I think it's very clear. And it should be clear to each one of us. That what we see taking place in the social and political and in the religious world is letting us know that Jesus is at the door. He's about to put an end to the great controversy. But before he does that, the command to his people is blow the trumpet in Zion. Blow the trumpet among my people. And notice what the verse says. It says blow the trumpet in Zion and then it says sound an alarm. Now what does an alarm do brothers and sisters? It wakes you up. That means there's a particular message that God has given to, to Zion and for Zion that will wake them up and show them what time it is. When you set your clock tonight or your alarm for tomorrow morning, as soon as that alarm goes off, you know it's six o'clock in the morning. Are you with me? So the message that God has given for Zion must wake God's people up and show them what time it is. Are you following me? But there's more. We're looking at the trumpet here. Let's go to Numbers chapter 10. What is this trumpet for? We've seen that it is to show us the time, but let's go to Numbers chapter 10. Numbers, the 10th chapter. In Numbers chapter 10, are you there? Look at what the Bible says in verse 1. It says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, for of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. So if you lived in ancient Israel, you knew that when the trumpet sounded, depending on how the trumpet sounded, you were either to begin taking your journey or to gather together. Are you following me? In other words, the trumpets were used simply to let God's people know what they ought to do. Are you following me? So now we've learned that when the trumpet sounds at the end of time, it must show God's people the time. It must wake them up, show them the time in which they're living. Now we've seen that that trumpet sound must also show God's people what their duty is. Look at verse 3. I found verse 3 very interesting. Listen, when the trumpet is sounding, and when they shall blow with them, that's with the trumpet, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Give me another word for tabernacle of the congregation church or sanctuary so the trumpet sounding was to call the ancient israel to the sanctuary is there a sanctuary where we need to gather right now where is jesus right now hebrews 8 tells us that he's at the right hand of god in the heavenly sanctuary that means the message that is synonymous with the blowing of the trumpet in our time must call the people of god zion to come to the heavenly sanctuary are you following me friends now let's read verse 9 Verse 9, or Numbers chapter 9 and verse, sorry, Numbers chapter 10 and verse 9. It says, and if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and you shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and you shall be saved from your enemies. That means there was a connection between the blowing of the trumpets anciently, when ancient Israel went to, go, went to war and the trumpets were sounding, God would work for their salvation. In other words, he would save them. 
Now, brothers and sisters, this lets us know that when the right message is given in our time, which wakes God's people up, shows them the time, shows them what their duty is, gathers them to the heavenly sanctuary, that message, God will use that message to bring salvation to Zion. Are you following me, friends? There's only one message that does that, brothers and sisters. Only one message. What is it? It's the first, second, and third angel's messages. It tells us the hour in which we are living, the judgment hour. It tells us what our duty is. Fear God, give him glory, worship him. And it, it, through that message, God is going to save his people in this time. Remember, you're either going to receive the mark of the beast or the seal of God. The third angel's message is the same thing as the blowing of the trumpet in our time. And if the three angels' messages are not being taught and preached in our churches, there's no trumpet sounding in Zion. Are you following me what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? That means it's time to blow the trumpet. Amen? It's time to blow the trumpet. Now listen to this. 12 manuscript release. Page 212, paragraph 3. The theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message, embracing the messages of the first and second angels. The theme of greatest importance to our church right now is the first, second, and third angel's messages. That's what I've just read. But listen how she ends. She says, all should understand the truths contained in these messages. Every man, woman, and child that attends Gloucester Seventh-day Adventist Church should understand the truths contained in those messages. Are you with me, friends? You know, last year I went to, to speak at the church. Afterwards, we had potluck, and as I was sitting at the potluck table, having uh, lunch with the elder of the church, he asked me to come do Bible studies with him because he said to me, I don't understand anything in the, in the three angels' messages. And I said, wow. Now, that is the leader of the church, brothers and sisters, by the, by the pastor. Brothers and sisters, if the enemy can keep the third angel's message out of our church, that's the first, second, and third angel's messages, there's no trumpet sounding, and Zion is going to be unprepared for the coming crisis. Are you with me, friends? And so in order to prepare for the latter rain, God wants to bring this threefold message back into our churches. Now, I want to finish this. Listen to this. All should understand the truths contained in these messages and demonstrate them in the daily life, for this is essential to salvation. Wow. So now the servant of the Lord is not simply saying we need to have an understanding of what it means to fear God or what who Babylon is or that she's fallen or what the mark of the beast is. It's important to know those things and we should study those things. But now the servant of the Lord is saying that we not only need, need an understanding of these things, but we need to practice them in the daily life or else we will be unprepared for the coming of Christ. How important is the third angel's message? It's essential, brothers and sisters. This, uh, this statement says we should demonstrate them in the daily life for this is essential to salvation. You know, when essential means you cannot live without it. So what do you say? We bring back those messages. Amen. Now, I want to show you something. The devil... The devil has been on this earth for thousands of years, and he knows what he's doing. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Now, this is the chapter that is dealing with end time events. Matthew 24. Listen to what Jesus says here. Matthew 24, and I'm going to read verse, verse 3. And I'm asking that you just pray for me so that I can... My mind can be clear as I present. Matthew 24 verse 3 says, And as he, that's Jesus, sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man do what? Okay, so the first thing Jesus says, he doesn't say there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. He doesn't say there's going to be pestilences and famines and all these things. The first thing Jesus mentions is deception. Church, is there deception in our world today? You know, we live in a time where, you, where you, when you get a WhatsApp video, you don't know whether it's real or fake. Are you with me? There's deception in the world. Now, let me ask you a serious question. Is there deception in the church of God? Yes. But now the question is, is there deception in my life and yours? Is there deception in our homes? Go to the book of James chapter 1. I want to show you something. Remember, Jesus said that deception is the main thing at the end of time. Well, he said it's the first thing. James chapter 1. 
And remember, we're going to connect this to what we've learned about the blowing of the trumpets and the third angel's message. James chapter 1. And when you're there, I'm going to read in James chapter 1 and verse 22. Are you there? The Bible says, but be ye doers, but be, <laughs> but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And how does it end? Deceiving your own selves. Brothers and sisters, listen. Listen to what the Bible is saying. It's possible to have an understanding of the three angels' messages. It's possible to teach what the mark of the beast is. It's possible to have an intellectual understanding of everything that God has shown us and yet be in deception, deceiving our own selves if we fail to walk in that truth. And so God is saying it's not enough simply to be hearers of the word, but we must become doers of the word if we are going to prepare for the outpouring of the spirit of God. Are you with me, friends? Now listen to this. This is Desire of Ages, page 309, paragraph 2. Listen to this. The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that a mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. The scribes and Pharisees, because they had the truths that God had given them, they thought they were righteous. In fact, they were ready for the Messiah to come and set up his kingdom so that they could sit on the right and the left hand. Servant of the Lord says that the greatest deception, in other words, there is no greater deception, was that when you think you're right, when you're all wrong, that's the greatest deception you're in. Listen to it. It goes on. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has been proved to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. It does not bring forth the fruits of righteousness. And then she says this. Listen to this. We've just learned what the greatest deception in Christ's day was of the mind. The greatest deception of the mind. Now listen. The same danger still exists today. Many take it for granted that they are Christians simply because they subscribe to certain theological tenets. In other words, they take it for granted that they've heard the message of Revelation 14. But they have not brought it into the practical life. They have not believed and loved it. Therefore, they have not received the power and grace that comes through sanctification of the truth. Now, that's a lot of, there's a lot of words that I've said there. And listen to how she summarizes it now. This is what I want to say, brothers and sisters. This is what God wants to say to us today. Men may profess faith in the truth, but if it does not make them sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, heavenly minded, it is a curse to its possessors and through their influence, it is a curse to the world. Now, God has called us into the remnant church, brothers and sisters. He's called us to hear the first, second, and third angels' messages so that we can be transformed by that message and then give that message to the world. But if we only have a theoretical understanding of it, we are in the greatest deception, God says, if we are not practicing those truths. You know, I love that list because, brothers and sisters, I can see some struggle there in my own life with these things. It says, if these truths that we have does not make us sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, heavenly minded, then we become a curse to the world, brothers and sisters. Now tell me, what is the opposite of a curse? God brought you and I into this church to be a blessing, not a curse. And so he's showing us today that the trumpet sounding is the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages to call God's people to the heavenly sanctuary, to understand those messages, but more than that, to have an experience in them on a daily basis as we wait for the pouring out of the Spirit of God. So how is this going to happen? It's going to happen when we take serious what God has said in His Word and when we plead for power to live that life. We're going to get to that in a moment. Let me ask this question. Are we living in the sealing time for those who are students of prophecy? Are we living in the sealing time? Revelation chapter 7 tells us that before the trouble comes, the great time of trouble, God is going to place a seal upon his people. Now, I'm sure that because we're all on, in this church today and on Zoom, we all want to receive the seal of God because that seal protects us during the time of trouble. I'm reading from Testimonies to the Church, volume 5, page 214. Listen to what inspiration says. Not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. There are many even among those who teach the truth to others who will not receive the seal of God in their foreheads. Now we need to ask the question, why? 
Why is it that people can come on the pulpit in our churches, expound upon the word, teach deep truths, and yet they will not receive the seal of the living God? She goes on. She says, they had the light of truth. They knew their master's will. They understood every point of our faith, but they had not corresponding works. Brothers and sisters, what is God saying to us? As we learn, as we learn about the blowing of the trumpet at this time of earth's history, yes, there's a message that needs to come back into our church. But brothers and sisters, now more than ever, we need to take that message, understand it theoretically, but plead with God for power so that we can follow that message. Amen? Let's see how this is going to get done. Go to Joel chapter 2. So as we prepare for the outpouring of the Spirit of God, let's bring back the third angel's message, the first, second, and third angel's message. Joel chapter 2, how is this going to take place? Joel chapter 2 and verse 12, the Bible says, it says, there's a work for us to do in verse 12. It says, therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Verse 13, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. In these verses, brothers and sisters, God is giving us the remedy as we prepare for the outpouring of the Spirit. I want you to notice that there's a particular word that God uses in verse 12 and verse 13. It's the word turn. It says in verse 12, turn to the Lord your God. That's in, in verse 12, it says, turn to me with all your heart. Verse 13, it says, turn to the Lord your God. Brothers and sisters, now more than ever, God is calling upon us through the threefold message, through the messages that we are hearing on a weekly basis to turn to him. Now we need to understand from a biblical point or from a biblical sense, what does it mean to turn? What is it when God says, turn to me with all your heart? Keep your fingers in Joel. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 24. How is it that we are going to turn and what is it going to do for us? Listen to this. Proverbs chapter 1, and we're reading verse, let's read verse 23 rather. Verse 23. Are you there? It says, turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known unto you my words. Do you see in that verse, there's a condition for receiving the spirit of God? So when in Joel, when God says, turn to me with all your heart, when it says, turn to the Lord your God, what God is really saying is, turn at my reproof. Now church, what is reproof? It's rebuke or correction, right? We're walking down this road. Somebody says to us, you're going on the wrong path and you go down the other road, the right road, and God says you've turned. Let me give you an example of turning at the reproof of God. I was in camp meeting about some years ago in the North England conference. There was a powerful message that was being preached this particular night. But at this camp meeting, there were two ladies that are friends of my wife and I, and they were in attendance. One of the ladies was a Baptist woman. So she came into the youth tent that night where this pastor was preaching this wonderful message about Christ and him crucified. And he started preaching the message. And then he got to a certain point in his message and he started touching on something that had to do with the adornment of a Christian. He didn't elaborate on it. He simply touched on it. And then he pointed to Jesus and how much Jesus left for our salvation. And as we were sitting right next to these two individuals, I noticed presently that this Baptist woman began to cry. Nobody else saw it. Everybody was focused and riveted on the speaker because this message was power. The Holy Spirit was there. But that message of Christ's love, Christ's power, was also a message of reproof to that woman. And as she listened, she started crying. And the next day I went to visit her at her chalet, brothers and sisters, and I went there because I went with my scriptures, with my Bible. You know, inspiration tells us that when the word is preached from the pulpit, go the next day and open to them the scriptures so they can see clearly, so that they can have a foundation from the Bible. So I went with my Bible to the chalet, came into the chalet, and I seen this woman, these two ladies, and I sat down there, and I saw that the adornment that she had had on the night before, she no longer had it on. She turned at the reproof of God. 
And I said, praise the Lord. And I saw her sometime years later. This was a Baptist woman who was also leading out in a Baptist church. And I saw her sometime later. She attends the Seventh Adventist Church every week. And I saw her sometime later at the church, the particular church she attends. And she was still on the path of righteousness. Still faithful to the God of heaven. Listen to what God says. Turn at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. You know, brothers and sisters, there's a problem in our church today. And you know what that problem is? We are not like that Baptist woman. God tells us truth again and again, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and we refuse to turn at the reproof of God. If we are going to prepare for the outpouring of the spirit of God, the latter rain, brothers and sisters, when God reveals truth to us through his word, through the writings of Mrs. White, as we turn, he says, give my servant the spirit of God. Now is the time, brothers and sisters, when we want to turn. You know, I want to read from Patriarchs and Prophets. You can get the quote from me later. This is speaking about Pharaoh. You remember that Pharaoh reproved, God reproved Pharaoh again and again until Pharaoh was led to look at the death of his firstborn. Listen to what inspiration says. God speaks to men through his servants, giving cautions and warnings and rebuking sin. He gives to each an opportunity to correct his errors before they become fixed in character. You see, brothers and sisters, when God shines his light upon us, whether we are having devotion, whether we're at church or at prayer meeting, when we refuse to turn, we become more fixed in the character of refusing to turn from God. Are you with me? Listen to what she says. She says, but if one refuses to be corrected, divine power does not interpose to counteract the tendency of his own action. He finds it more easy to repeat the same course. He is hardening his heart against the influence of the Holy Spirit. My brothers and sisters, what is God saying to us? He's simply saying, turn at my reproof and I will give you my spirit. I will make known unto you my words. Amen, church? You know, as I was considering this with my own life, I, I suddenly realized that now more than ever, there's only one thing that God wants. And that's what I saw in this Baptist woman. And that is prompt obedience. Not simply obedience, prompt obedience, because that's what that lady did. It was a rebuke to me, brothers and sisters. Go to the book of Ezekiel chapter 18, because I'm dealing here with the final generation, or I'm sitting, or I'm preaching to the final generation, I believe. I believe that Christ is coming in our lifetime. Ezekiel chapter 18, I want you to notice, we're studying what it means to turn, because God says, turn to me with all your heart. Turn unto the Lord your God. Listen to what it means to turn. Ezekiel chapter 18 and I'm looking at verse 30. The Bible says in verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord your God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. So when God says, calls upon his people to turn, he calls upon his people to turn from how much? Did you notice there? To turn from all sin. Now, I might as well touch on this because I've touched on the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages are to call God's people out of darkness, but to cause them to be transformed so that they turn from all sin. That means if there's a message in our churches today which waters down the issue of sin and says it doesn't matter, that is not the message that God has given to prepare us for the rain that's coming. It's a message that comes from the devil's pulpit. God is calling upon his people to turn from all sin. And I want to quote, paraphrase from Steps to Christ. You know that lovely book, Steps to Christ? It says, the condition for eternal life now is just what it has always been from the days of Adam. Perfect obedience to the law of God. Perfect righteousness. Somebody says, how are we going to do that? In a moment, we're going to see how we do that. But brothers and sisters, listen what God is saying. He's saying to us, as we come to the time where the latter rain is going to be poured out, he's looking for a people that will understand and experience victory over every wrong word, wrong thought, and wrong action. And in a moment, we're going to see how. But first, we need it in our minds that God is able. Can you say amen? amen. God is able. Now, how is this going to happen? Go to Joel chapter 2. I want you to see this. There's power in the word of God. Watch this now. Joel chapter 2. And I'm, I'm reading verse 12 and 13 again. The Bible says in verse 12, Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. There is he calling upon us to turn. It says in verse 13, 
and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Very interesting that the very same verse that God calls upon us to turn from all sin is the same verse where he says, I'm merciful, I'm gracious, I'm long-suffering, I'm abundant in goodness and truth. Now, true repentance, brothers and sisters, if I were to ask what true repentance is, true repentance is a sorrow that we receive from God and a turning away from sin. That's what it is. But how do we do that? According to this scripture, it is as we view the character of God that God can work in us to turn from all sin. Let me make it clear to us. The book Education, page 263, I want you to listen to this statement, brothers and sisters. Because oftentimes when we think of repentance, we think, must I do this if I, you know, spend more time in prayer or if I do these Bible studies, or if I do this, then it's going to help me so that I can have true repentance. And those things are right. But I want to give you the motive of those who are going to overcome all sin and be ready for the latter rain. Listen to this. Those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel, think of it, of it in relation to themselves and to the world. In other words, when we think about hastening or hindering the gospel and finishing the work so that we can go home, we think about in relation to ourselves. We say, Lord, I'm tired of this world. I don't want to be in a world of sin. And friends, that's the right thought. We don't want to become comfortable here. But listen to how she ends. There are few that think of its relation to God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not begin or end with his manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain of the what? The pain that from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. What did sin do, brothers and sisters? It brought a pain to the heart of God. So those who are going to truly repent and have that sorrow for sin so that they, they turn away from all sin, are they, going, they are going to understand what that sin does to the heart of Jesus. Oftentimes, brothers and sisters, we speak words that grieve the spirit of God. Oftentimes, we conduct ourselves toward one another in a way that the spirit of God is grieved. Jesus is grieved sometimes when we conduct ourselves in a way that is displeasing to him. Those who are going to overcome all sin are going to understand what sin does to the heart of God. And when they have that understanding, power will be given them, supernatural power to turn from every sin. The question is, do you want that power? Then we need to understand what sin caused the Savior. Can you say amen to that? This is the cross, brothers and sisters. This is a cross. That's why Christ died, to show us the seriousness of sin. He came to save us not in sin, but from sin. This is the motive. This is the power that we need if we're going to turn. But the question is how? Because this is the motive that we have when we understand how the Spirit, how the Father, how Jesus is grieved when we disobey. That's the motive that we can have to turn. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, the love of Christ constraineth me. Every time he was about to fall or to go astray, the Spirit of Prophecy tells us he looked back at the cross, saw how much it cost, and then he continued in the path of righteousness. So how do we turn, brothers and sisters? You know, the answer is in that word, turn. God said, turn to me with all your heart. Turn to the Lord your God. Go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, notice what the Bible says in verse 19. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19. The Bible says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death. Let's stop there for a moment. Even as I'm standing here in this pulpit today, the spirit of God is speaking to each one of us and saying, I've set before you this day, life and death. Listen to what it's, how it ends. It says, therefore, in fact, before I get there, it says, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, do what? 
choose life. Brothers and sisters, that word choose is how we turn from all sin. You see, brothers and sisters, although we serve a mighty God who's powerful and who can do all things, the work of turning belongs to you and I. It's a choice. And God says, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Now, I'm sitting in a church where I see parents and their seed. It's very interesting that in the Bible, oftentimes you see when the parent turns, the child turns. John the Baptist's parents, they turned to the Lord their God. John the Baptist turned. Noah and his wife turned to the Lord their God. Their, parents, their sons turned. It's often the case when the parents turn, the children will turn. Brothers and sisters, how are we going to conquer every sin? It is by the choices we make. Then how important is the daily choice that we make when we wake up each morning? How important the choice when we go to work? How important the words we speak at work? The things we're thinking about during the day. How important are those choices? Those choices are going to determine our eternal destiny. That's what God is showing us. You know, I shared this message a couple of, maybe a month ago or, or so. And I shared with, the, with the, the, the church there. When Jesus tells the parable of the wheat and tears, he says something fascinating to me. He said, that both the wheat and the tears grow together to the harvest. Oftentimes we think, what can I do to grow my faith? I can study the word, I can pray, I can do evangelism. Those are things that help us to grow. But did you know that the wicked are growing for the harvest as well? That means every decision that you and I are making is settling us, is, is settling us either into the truth that will prepare character for eternity, or it's settling us on the side of the enemy so that when the storm comes, we're going to be taken away. My brothers and sisters, it's time that we examine each choice we make. Because the choices we make now are going to either prepare us for the latter rain or we're going to miss out when that rain falls. I'm reading from Steps to Christ, page 47. It says, everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections. But you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. He will then work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Listen, listen how she closes. Thus, your whole nature will be brought under the control of the spirit of Christ. Your affections will be centered upon him. Your thoughts will be in harmony with Jesus. By the choice, brothers and sisters. Great controversy tells us that it's through the will, it is through the choice that Satan regains his hold upon you and I. So now, more than ever, when we leave this place, we're praying that God will help us in every choice that we make. You know, young people are choosing today, even in this late stage, who they're going to gonna have as friends, which university they're going to go to, who they're going to partner, who they're going to have as a partner to marry. All the ones we're choosing every day. God is saying it's time to make sanctified choices. Can you say amen? amen. Go back to Joel with me. Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse. I'm not going to read the verses again. There was something more I wanted to touch on. It's very interesting in verse 12 and verse 13. Both mention the heart. In verse 12, it says, Therefore now turn to me with all your heart. Verse 13, rend your heart. In other words, preparation for the latter rain is a work that needs to take place internally. So oftentimes we can come to church and we can look the part. We can stand here before the people of God. But there's a work that might be missing inside. And that's a work between you and I and God. Amen? It's interesting when I was studying this and I was sharing it, I, was, I thought about individuals who rent their garments in the Bible. You know, it says here in Joel 2, it says, rent your heart, not your garments. And I thought about individuals who rent their garments in the scriptures. Now, you may know some, but I was thinking about the King Josiah. Do you remember that when the present truth was taught him, the book of Deuteronomy, as he heard the scriptures, it had such a powerful impact upon him. He rent his clothes. He called the highest men in his kingdom. And he said, go to the prophetess and inquire, what does the Lord want us to do? That was a, that was a symbol that his heart had been rent 
under the preaching of the word of God. Are you with me? But there was another man who rent his garment as well. And that was Caiaphas. You remember that when the present truth, Jesus himself was standing before Caiaphas. Inspiration tells us that Caiaphas was under conviction when he saw the way Christ conducted himself. When he saw the demeanor of Jesus, when he saw how peaceful and calm Christ was, the conviction came to his heart that this was the Son of God. But brothers and sisters, he made a choice. He made a choice, and brothers and sisters, he's going to wake up in the second resurrection. He rejected Christ. He rejected the present truth. It's time to rent our heart. It's time to rent our heart and not our garments, God is saying, and turn to the Lord our God. Amen? Now, when this work is done, I want you to notice what God says. He repeats in verse 15. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of a closet. Let me touch on the children just one moment because it says the children there. The children in our churches are going to be alive during the time of the latter rain. The latter rain is going to fall not only on those old in years, but on the children. But now is the time, brothers and sisters, when we want to educate our children in the present truth message so that they can be prepared for what's coming. Yes, it's good to tell them the story about how David killed Goliath and how Daniel was in the lion's den. But we need, they need to understand the things that are taking place at this time so that they can prepare for what's coming. And I always share this, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand, in 1844, when the people of God were preparing for the soon coming of Christ, there were children as young as 11, 12, and 13. They would get together at each other's homes. And they would go into the garden. And what would they do in the garden? They would go to the bottom of the garden and spend time in prayer. 11, 12, and 13-year-olds praying that God would prepare them for the coming of Christ. It's time to raise up a youth, a generation of youth and young people that will prepare to finish this work. This is what God is waiting for. But notice what the Bible says there, verse 17. Verse 17 says, Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Very interesting. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us that God is saying that there needs to be a fasting and praying right now. There needs to be a gathering of the people of God right now. And as the leaders of the church, the elders of the church, the pastors of the church, and you and I engage in this fast, in this prayer experience, the Bible says in verse 17, let them weep between the porch and the altar and say, spare thy people, O Lord. Very interesting. This is a particular prayer that prepares for the latter rain. You know, as I was thinking about this, I said to myself, what is God saying to us as we prepare for the outpouring of the Spirit? What is he actually trying? To, what is the message he's trying to convey? Go to the book of Exodus chapter 34. I want you to see this. Exodus 34. In Exodus chapter 34. The Bible says in verse. Sorry, it's Exodus 32. Not Exodus 34. It's Exodus 32. And I'm going to begin reading from verse 31. Let me give you the context. Moses is in the mountain of God. He's discussing with God. He's getting revelations from God. And the children of Israel are down in the bottom, worshiping a golden calf. You all remember that, right? So the children of Israel are in apostasy. And Moses now, he goes up to God. And I want you to notice what it says in verse 31. It says, and Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, Lord, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Now, church, look at the context of what's happening. Moses is the righteous man who's God, whom God is using to lead the children of Israel. He's in the mountain of God, and while he's there, the children of Israel are in deep apostasy. They're worshiping a golden calf. And yet, even though they've gone so far in apostasy, Moses goes up to God and says, God, forgive their sin. And if you can't forgive them, Lord, take my name out of your book. 
You know, in Joel chapter 2, verse 17, the Bible tells us that those who receive the outpouring of the Spirit of God are going to have a spirit like the Spirit of Moses who will be willing to intercede for the people of God. Are you with me, friends? Now, let me ask you, are you interceding for God's people? We may say yes, and I hope you are interceding and praying for your brothers and sisters in your family and in the church. But let's make this real. Moses is interceding for a people who have fallen away from God, who are backsliding, and yet they're with the people of God. You know, there's worship services today in the Seventh Adventist Church that are not of God. There's all kinds of playing of drums and jumping around in the church, and people think that that's acceptable worship. That is not acceptable, brothers and sisters. But what we're reading here is that the spirit of Moses, instead of simply rebuking them, Moses is interceding for his brethren who are in apostasy. Moses has the love of God in his heart, and therefore he's interceding for his brethren. Are you with me, friends? Those who are going to receive the outpouring of God's spirit, though they see apostasy in worship services, though they see apostasy in any other, uh, any other standard in the remnant church, whether it's in worship, whether it's in dress, whether it's in diet, that is not going to simply lead God's people to simply blow the trumpet. But more than that, God's people are going to spend time in prayer, praying that God would spare his people, spare his people who have gone astray. Are you with me, friends? Brothers and sisters, there are many people who are going astray, even in the church today. And God is saying, we need to intercede for them. Let me show you how serious this is. Go to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. This is the spirit that we need. Numbers, the 14th chapter. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 14. We're reading verse 19. Let me give the context again. The Bible tells us that God sent 10 spies to spy out the land. 12 spies. How many returned with a good report? Only two. Two returned with a good report. 10 came with an evil report. Now we know what happened. We know the story. But I want you to notice something that's very powerful. Look at verse 10. This is after Caleb and Joshua were trying to appeal to the people of God. It says in verse 10, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones. This is the people of God, brothers and sisters. What did they want to do? They wanted to stone Caleb and Joshua to death. Now, how many of us would, would have been there and picking up stones? You don't need to answer that. You need to think about this, brothers and sisters. The congregation, it says, all the congregation bade them, stone them with stones. And then God's glory appeared, which put them in check. God stopped them. But I want you to notice what happens in verse 19. This is Moses again. He's interceding. It says, Lord, in verse 19, Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now, and as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt until now, verse 20, and the Lord said, I have done what? I have pardoned according to, according to thy word. Isn't that powerful, brothers and sisters? This is Moses, the man of God, who interceded on behalf of backsliding Israel. And because of his intercession, forgiveness was granted to the people of God. What is God looking for in the last days before the latter rain is poured out? He's looking for a people that will have his love so deep in them. It doesn't matter that we see apostasy simply and we only call it out by name. We need to be in the closet, brothers and sisters, pleading with God that he would spare his people. That is giving a demonstration of the love of God. And that prepares us for the outpouring of the spirit of God. You know, it's very interesting. Numbers chapter 16, Numbers chapter 20, these same Israelites are in rebellion time and again. And every time they come into rebellion, Moses pleads before God. The spirit of Moses is needed right now. Amen? We need to be people of intercession. Now let's go back to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, as we come to an end. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel chapter 2. You know, as I'm considering this verse, it says, let your people weep, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord. That's the prayer we are to pray, brothers and sisters. Now, when this experience is reached, notice what God says in verse 23. It says, 
Be glad then, ye children of Zion. That's you and I. And rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will call, cause to come down to you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. You know what we've looked at today, brothers and sisters, is an experience in the former rain. What we need is the former rain. We need the experience of God in our lives today so that when the latter rain falls, it will come upon us. It's very interesting that Joel says, be glad then, ye children of Zion. God has given the former rain moderately, but the latter rain is going to be more abundant. Brothers and sisters, I believe that we're approaching the time when the spirit of God is going to be poured out. I think that signs of the times are showing us clearly that God is going to put an end to the work. And he's going to use Zion, the remnant, and those who are faithful in Zion. I want to ask you, where is your experience with the Lord right now? What is it right now, brothers and sisters, that is keeping you from having the right experience and preparing for the outpouring of God's spirit? If there's such a thing today, by God's grace, when we leave the service, let us put that away and let us walk with Christ daily now so that when the rain falls, we will be a part of it. Amen. Amen. How many of us want to say, Lord, I have failed many a time in my life, but today I want to say, Lord, I want the former rain experience. I want that former rain so that when the latter rain falls, I will be ready. If it's your desire, please raise your hands. Let's bow our heads for prayer, saints. Father in heaven, I want to praise you and thank you for being with us as we opened your word this morning. Lord, we're so thankful that you've called us into the remnant church, into your movement this morning and in, in this life, Lord. We're so thankful and grateful that we have been called to be a part of your people. But Lord, so often we have failed to give the right representation. So often we have failed to walk according to your will. I pray, dear Lord, this morning that you would please fall upon us afresh this morning. Upon each one that is upon the computer, upon Zoom, and even here in this church. Please give us the former rain, Lord. And as the former rain falls, Lord, please prepare us for the latter rain. Please don't let any of us be missing, Lord. We don't want to be lost, Lord. We want to see you face to face. So, Father, do the work that you need to do within us so that we can be ready to stand. Thank you for hearing our prayer, Lord. Bless us now as we part and be with us until we meet you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, only, only the only final comment that message needs is a praise God. And uh, as Monique is already up, I hand over to her as she's been leading us in our last hymn, 442. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's please stand. <clears throat> How sweet are the tidings that greet the pilgrims near as we wander in exile from home. Soon, soon will the Savior in glory appear, and soon will the kingdom come. He is coming. Coming, coming soon, I know. Coming back to this earth again. And the weary pilgrims will to glory go when the Savior comes to reign. The mercy of grace where the pilgrims sleep shall be open as wide as before. And the millions that sleep in the mighty deep shall live on this earth evermore. He is coming, coming, coming soon, I know. Coming back to this earth again, and the weary pilgrim will to glory go when the Savior comes to reign. There will be need to part in our happy days.
and hope, sweet songs of redemption will sing. From the north, from the south, though the ransom shall come and worship heavenly King. He is coming, coming, coming soon, I know. Coming back to the earth again, and the weary pilgrims will to glory go when the Savior comes to reign. Hallelujah, amen, hallelujah again, soon and faithful we all shall be there. Oh, be watchful, be hopeful, be joyful, till to end, and a crown of bright glory will wear. He is coming, coming, coming soon, I know, coming back to this earth again, and the weary pilgrims will to glory go when the Savior comes to reign. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that Jesus is coming again. We know that this world is not our home. But Lord, we pray that you will complete the work that you began in us. So that when you return, we will say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. So thank you for hearing our prayer. Dismiss us with your presence until we meet again today, but also until we meet you in the clouds of glory face to face. By your grace, we pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. amen. May the light of God shine on. Shine on us today. May it show us where to travel. Lead us back if we stray. May the light of God shine on us today. May the peace of God be with us today. May the peace of God be with us today. May it guide us and protect us as we go our separate way. May the peace of God be with us. May the love of God live in us. May the light of God shine on us today. And every day. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs>